So, hello again. I said this morning that we have to dare and try and try again, and I am in the middle of uh, two absolutely, absolutely amazing women who has tried, dare, succeed, fail, resucceed, and I think it will be uh, absolutely amazing to hear how they have done that. So Peggy, Peggy Boucher, I met you a few months ago, but I have seen you on television many times before. Uh, you, have, um, you love the sea, and you have pushed your life to the limit of your body and your, and your life by um, being the alone woman to row across the Atlantic Ocean. And not only you did it once, but you failed a very short time before the arrival because of the uh, bad weather, and you redid it a second time, and you are also an entrepreneur. And to see your life, we have a short video coming. Cette nuit, il y a à peu près 30 nœuds de vent, donc une mer de 5 voire 6 mètres. La VGRC. Et voilà, bon, je vous laisse, j'ai du boulot, moi. j'ai de la route à faire encore. Et j'ai mal au dos, ils ne sont pas permis. Bah par ça tout va bien. Je viens de passer la mi-parcours. Voilà. Ah Ce qui a été l'obsession de près de 24 jours. Ah de mer. pour une ligne. Ouais. Papa oh, là, là. Tu vois, je t'avais promis. J'ai eu ma vie. So before I ask question to Peggy, let me just introduce uh, Oksana. Oksana has been, you have been eight time Paralympic medalist, including two gold medals uh, earlier this year. And um, you have begun your career in the Paralympic career in, uh, in London in, in 2012, uh, winning the US uh, first medal in rowing event and then went to compete as game, uh, at the game of Nordic skiing and cycling, so you don't only row, but you do all sports. 
This is an extraordinary accomplishment for an athlete, but uh, you are not only an athlete. You are born in Ukraine following the Chernobyl disaster. And um, you have uh, been there alone, you told me, uh, in an orphan. And uh, there is someone who is very important in your life, who is in this room, and I think she also needs a round of applause, who is gay, your mother, your, who, who adopted you. And uh, she waited two years to get you because the adoption was closed. And uh, you were every day looking at her picture also on the other side, so I think your two souls were connected, even if you had only photographies of each of you, this is an amazing story. And so you went to US and uh, since uh, you were very active, she decided to put you on sports and with the success that uh, we know. <laughs> so Piggy, um, you often quote uh, Seneca, your guiding mantra, who is saying, and I quote, it's not because things are difficult that we do not dare, it's because we do not dare that they are difficult. I think you can prove that. And um, what does daring mean for you? Actually, this sentence is very special because it says a story. When I was 10, my daddy fixed it on the wall, just above, uh, on the wall above my little desk. I think he probably regretted it afterward. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I realized and I understood that audacity is the driving force of our existence. We are not born daring, we become daring. And for me, um, daring means, after, after, first of all, sorry, that um, it's getting out our comfort zone, but it also means not being afraid of the failure and of other people's opinions. But it also means not being afraid of um, the opinions and not being afraid of start it again. So, <laughs> and in order to develop the questions, um, so maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more because we saw that very quickly in the movie that you went through the Atlantic. Well, how was the feeling when you failed the first time at a very close from the uh, from the arrival? And I how did you find the uh, energy to restart again? Because, first of all, for me, um, I've always considered audacity as a muscle. <laughs> um, because when you try to train yourself, actually, you have the potential to go forward. And uh, the more you use it, the stronger you become. And in my everyday life, I always wanted to, to, to see what I wanted to want, not I wanted to fear. So that's what's important for me. So what did you want to prove by going across the Atlantic? I want to prove that women can achieve such a feat. <laughs> it was quite difficult because, uh, honestly, I couldn't imagine it was so difficult. Because as a woman, I thought, basically, I thought it was an asset. Being a woman for marketing, communication, part of you, and the other asset, I, I, I get, in my mind, I was young. And when, and when I tried to meet you know, communication managers, they told me, if you were my daughter, I would never let you go. So when I heard this sentence, I knew it was over. I felt like quitting. It was hard, actually. And I, I couldn't imagine it could be so difficult to get through this. So. I decided to resign from my job because I was financial engineer in company Alcatel in Paris. And I decided to sail across the Atlantic in order to have a greater experience of the sea. And after once on board, the skipper told me, look, you have neither the muscles, the experience, and the mental force to achieve your project. Wow, <laughs> that's so violence. And he told me, look at you, you're just a woman, so you can't do it. Actually, I didn't argue. I observed, I, I was on board for one thing, learning. But at the end of this setting, <laughs> of this setting trip, it reinsured my, uh, my motivation to go on my own, believe me. <laughs> And this is why I decided then after to... Did you go again. back to him and uh, after of your course. success? <laughs> and did he apologize? <laughs> I actually, I didn't need to speak a lot. <laughs> he understood it. 
So, um, Oksana, uh, when you see when we, you see your story, it's it's uh, hard to not ask what is really what drives you, and how did you do? Is it passion or revenge or just to prove something that makes you such an athlete or just passion? Can you tell us what comes into your mind when you are fighting like that? All the above that you just said, <laughs> honestly, um, it's definitely. You know, actually, I liked how you did say revenge because I did grow up in an environment that wasn't ideal for a kid, but it was, I didn't know anything different. Um, it was my normal. And for the first seven years, I didn't have the ability to speak for myself, to say when I was hungry, to say what was hurting. And then so I guess now in some ways, it is a little bit of revenge, like China, like just putting everything out there and kind of being able to just let everything out. But in like a positive way. And it's what I heard a lot growing up was you can't do this, you'll never be able to walk, you won't be able to. When I first wanted to find out like I want to get into the Paralympics, somebody said, oh, that's a nice dream, but you should really find something else to do with your life. And like, you're just not the athlete's build because I am small for my size. I don't look like an elite jacked athlete for the most part. And that kind of, fueled me because I got really tired of people telling me what I can and can't do based on my appearance and what I have or don't have. And I never had someone to look at and be like, well, she's my inspiration, she did it, I can do it. So it was hard for me to kind of like believe in myself and doubt myself, but also not doubt myself and, pers and just persevere anyways. And I guess what really motivates me is just being a stepping stone to that next little girl who wants to become a Paralympic athlete, whether she's missing a leg or, or Olympics, doesn't matter, or is small for her size, or the fact that she's a girl trying to do a sport or row across the, the ocean <laughs> and stuff. And um, yeah. So um, you say that when you left Ukraine, you were very small and uh, you were nearly dying, uh, starving. and. Uh, As, uh, where is your mother? Oh, oh geez. Race, race. <laughs> oh, <fuck. laughs> I'm biased, but I really do have the best mom in the world. <laughs> So, um, when you arrive in America, you told me that uh, you were at school in Ukraine, you have only one hour school, and yeah. after you had to go, go seven hours school. So, that was a completely ch shift of life. How do you, that was your first battle, no? Yeah, I, I guess so. It's interesting. I never really looked at it as a first battle because um, everything was just changing for the better, and I never really realized what wasn't normal until I got my life in America and once I found out what it's interesting because I've always prayed and wanted a mom but I never understood what a mom was I never was hugged or kissed or had a mother's love but like it felt so natural and so right the minute that um yeah we came into each other's life and being in um yeah being in America and experiencing that So, Oksana, you know that, and uh, you are a role model for a lot of people, and I think in, uh, uh, everyone in this room will think that. Uh, I'm sure that you have not done that to be a role model. You have done that because you want it. What is, do you feel a special responsibility for that, or uh, how do you think you can live with that now that you are to becoming... To be a role model? Yeah, to be a role model. Um, You know, I've been asked that, actually, like, do you feel like it's your responsibility? And I look at it as it's an extreme honor to be able to just be one person, one example to hopefully, like, I will die a happy woman if there's one girl that decides to just follow her dreams. So I actually got um, an, e an email through Facebook, and it was a mom saying, because when I was in high school, I never felt pretty because of my legs. I was so self-conscious. I was trying to hide who I was in my prosthetic legs. And it was attracting the wrong kind of attention when I was trying to hide, take away the attention. And um, 
she sends me an email and she said that this, this girl who's like 14 years old and the same as me, when I went to school, I wore pants all the time. I covered up my arms all the time because I didn't want people to see that I had fake legs. And this girl saw a video of me and decided to wear a dress for the first time in school after it. And for me, that's what it's about is just whether it's sports or igniting that like self-belief in yourself and loving yourself and knowing it's okay to appreciate what you have is like a win and to be just an example, one example in a room full of incredible women who are doing the same thing for the next generation of female leaders. Peggy, you have an hour project. Yeah. You want to do a movie of women like you, like Oksana <laughs> and other women. Can you tell us a bit about your project and the way you want to drive it? Yeah, so this movie will be a documentary for the cinema. The name is Dare. <laughs> it's written, produced and directed, directed by women. But it's not a girly movie. <laughs> Actually, we want to make the bridge people between people, those who dare, and the other who are afraid of getting out of that comfort zone. Because in nowadays, society, actually, precaution, attention, problem, have replaced in our vocabulary words, such as victory, actions, project, solutions. In the meanwhile, everything is becoming fear. Fear of unemployment, fear of loneliness, fear of strikes, and in the, in the movie, we want to make discover to the people that actually how does the brain behaves when we are afraid, when we act, when we dare, thanks to neuroscience. And after, we will meet some people, daring people, men, women, kids, senior, adults, because we don't, we don't dare at 20 as we dare at 70. And it's very important to know their stories, their stories, how did they overcome the obstacles and the failure, what is their source of inspiration. And we want to inspire people to show that these people cross their own Atlantic. So it will start, the, the film will be launched on spring 2020. And if you want to be a part of it, you're welcome on board, so. <laughs> uh, Oksana, just uh, the last question before we have some testimonials. Um, we see a lot of uh, young uh, girls and boys who uh, are not, has a, or have no disability at all, but uh, they are, um, they don't believe in the future. They believe that they can't do anything. They believe that the, they are, surrender with difficulties. And uh, you have gone across all the difficulties being uh, um, in an orphan when you were young, having now uh, uh, going across the Atlantic, find a new life, be an athlete, go at the top of what is the, the hardest. What, what is really inside your body, in your soul, that makes you fighting that, uh, this way? And how, what, ca what can you say to the... Uh, people of your age and, and to us to um, help us to have this driver and to this uh, love of life, if I can say it this way? Um, that's, that's an awesome question. So I, I mentioned earlier with, I think for like my generation of, of people, whether you have a disability or not disability, like social media has a very powerful impact and it has also a not so powerful impact because it's a very filtered lifestyle too. And it can be either for the good or for the bad. And I think what for me is the minute I stopped letting others determine what I can do and say what I can become is when I started kind of living my life and being passionate about my life. And instead of seeing obstacles of what's going wrong, I was able to look at something that was a unique door that just opened that would not have happened. I would not be a Paralympic athlete if I did not have my legs. I've had opportunities because I'm missing my legs that I would have never dreamed about and turned into possibilities. And that's the thing for these young kids and my era is to not let 
what people think of you and what they see you as determine how you view yourself in the mirror. So, Oksana and Peggy, you have shown that everything is possible. It's just about being on yourself and uh, follow your dream. We have a... Um, you remember this morning I was uh, uh, asking who were the people who dared to come on stage and to say uh, their story in 60 seconds. We have three of them who have uh, been uh, okay to be in front of Peggy and Oksana, and for that they need also a strong applaud because uh, they, it needs a lot of courage. So they will come. We have uh, Kimberly Gear, Liliana Reche Nyak. It's okay? Sorry if I don't say well your name. And Erin Oliver. And Kimberly is starting. My name is Kimberly Geyer. I'm the founder of a movement called Global Women Leaders Strategic Philanthropy. The Me Too movement has catalyzed women like no time in our memory. Women across the globe are standing up, they're taking their place, they're using their voice, and they're taking action. They're shining a light on injustice, taking on leadership roles, and taking a seat at the table. It's a tremendous groundswell, and the impending shift is palpable. We can feel it. We're here. We're inspired by women doing incredible things from incredible circumstances. It's necessary and it's well overdue. But there is no Me Too movement. There is no groundswell for women and girls in fragile and forgotten context. And as a former banker, I've chosen to use my time, my skills, my expertise pro bono to lead a group of women leaders from around the globe to take on some of these challenges because it will be a shallow victory for us as women if we leave these women and girls behind. They have often no voice, no rights. I didn't expect to get emotional, but I'm emotional. <laughs> no pathway to justice. I've seen them in the fields. They're incredibly dignified and resilient. They are not victims. They are coping every day. So what I'd like to say is stand up, don't leave these women behind, join women like me and men and find pathways, use your skills, use your connections, use the system, shift the system to make a change. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Liana? Hi, uh, my name is Lilia. I am a woman with high functioning autism. And there are people like me and uh, who are also um, hypersensitive, hyperactive, and, and many different things that are invisible differences and that make us function and communicate differently from what most of the people are used to. And for this, many of these people are discriminated and, and, and silenced. And what I wanted to say is that if we give a voice to these people, if we uh, care to listen to them, they teach everybody else how to be more authentic and how to create a more, much more authentic communication and relationships. And they, the bridge cre is created naturally between everybody because we are more intimate in what we actually talk about. So this is what we do in, in the company that I've created. And this, this is the main message is that what we do for different people today can be applied to absolutely any person tomorrow. Thank you. What is the name of the, what is the, name of the company? Yeah. The, thank you. <laughs> the name of the company is Hip Hip In. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening today. My name is Erin. I'm the Vice President of Employee Health and Safety at a Canadian company called Modern Niagara. I'm also one of the founding members of the Prevention Council of Ontario, where my role is to provide guidance and strategic support to our Minister of Labour in trying to protect the citizens of Ontario's health, safety and wellness. Modern Niagara is one of Canada's largest mechanical and electrical contractors and we've made a very intentional stride to become the employer of choice and build buildings that give Canadians their experiences. We have three fundamental ways of doing that with our core values and our approach to how we build. But most importantly, we've decided to involve as much of the Canadian experience in our employment so that we can build and design and look after these Canadian experiences, whether they're hospitals or schools. 
and we look forward to creating more diverse and inclusion employment in our construction company. Thank you. Thank you. I really want to thank you all of you. I think you have been great. And uh, thank you, Oksana, and thank you, Peggy. I think you are lesson learned. And uh, yes, now everyone in the room will raise and dare. Thank you. Thank you.